Welcome back to another video and as promised I am starting a new series which is getting started with STM32. One of the most frequent questions I get is how can you get started with STM32 after maybe wanting to move up from something like Arduino. To a lot of people it's kind of frustrating sometimes because you don't know which software to use, you don't know which board is best to use for a beginner. So I'm going to talk about all those things today. This might end up being quite a long video, but I want to cover as much as I can to get you kind of best prepared for development with these boards. So as I kind of mentioned in the introduction to microcontrollers video, for this series I'm going to be using the STM32 Nucleo 64 board. If you are interested in getting this board, I'll leave a link in the description below. And as I said before, this is pretty much the best board you can get if you're a beginner you're looking to get into this and you kind of want a few more advanced features that this board will provide this board can actually be programmed by the arduino ide as well you'll notice it has these additional uh, headers on the inside of the regular pins and that's where you could interface to the exact same pins as something like an arduino uno but we're not going to go near that we're working with stm32 we want to work with the bare bones of the chip so that's what we'll be doing to kind of summarize what i'll show you in this video i'm going to basically show you how to download and set up all the software that you will need in order to develop for the stm32 i'll also show you a few useful resources and where you can go to download them what i've actually done here on my own machine is i've uninstalled all the software that i use to develop for stm32 so i'm going to have to re-download it all i'll walk you through it step by step so that you can follow exactly what i'm doing and the goal for the end of the video is to have all our software set up we're going to generate the hardware setup files so that we can program the board and the end goal is just to be able to flash code to the chip that's going to toggle a little blue led on the board so let's jump straight into it so as i mentioned there the board i'm going to be using is the stm32 nucleo 64 and uh, specifically the one with the f401 re chip these boards do come with slightly different variations of the chip I recommend you get the same one I have and I'll, as I said I'll leave a link to that in the description below if you want to purchase the same one. You can pick them up here in the UK between 10 and 15 pounds. That might be a little different depending where you live especially with the current chip shortage. Notice here that I'm on the ST website. This is your go-to place for any kind of resources that you want for the board. So this is the resource page for the Nucleo 64. You can see if we scroll down, we can get some information about the board, some of its features, and lots and lots of stuff. And if we go back to the top, there's a bunch of different tabs as well. So before we get into the software, I'm going to show you a few useful resources that you might need in the future, just so you kind of know where to look for them. So in this case, this is, as I said, the development board page. There is also another page here, which is for the chip itself. So this page contains all the information you'd need for the entire board, right? That includes the debugger, the peripherals around the board, anything to do with the board, right? Whereas this page, STM32F401RE, that is everything to do with the chip and only the chip. So there are different places for each of the resources, just to make that clear. So let's go back to the page that talks more about the development board. So what I wanted to show you here is if we click on this documentation tab, you can see there's a bunch of different things here that you might find useful. There's user manuals, product specifications, there's a couple of presentations. The one I really wanted to show you was under CAD resources. So in the future, say you enjoy working with STM32 and at some point you want to make a custom PCB similar to the one I've made recently that you might have seen on my Instagram. But basically this is where you find all that information. So we've got the Gerber files here. If you wanted to print your own board, you could go and do that. We've also got the bill of materials for this exact board. So all the components you see, the bill of materials for that is there. And the really useful one here is the schematic pack. So I'm going to go and download that just to show you what it is and you'll see why it's useful. So let's go ahead and extract that in our downloads folder. And depending on your experience with electronics, you might not be familiar with schematics or what they are. Uh, but basically, if we go in here, this will be a Chrome file PDF. If we zoom out a little bit, this basically represents 
the schematics for this board. It basically shows you how everything's laid out and how you can replicate it. So if we wanted to take this chip and put it on our own board, we would have to follow the schematic for the different pieces that we need. This part, for example, SWD, that stands for Serial Wire Debug. If we wanted to program a chip that's on a separate board, we need this connection to our ST programmer so that we could flash code to a separate board. And this is a whole other video in itself, which I will be making. So in the future, if you are interested in PCB design and development for STM32, I'll cover that where we go through the schematics and I'll show you how to design a PCB in Eagle. But again, another video, I just wanted to show you where they are because you will probably find them useful in the future. Now the next few resources I wanna show you are in this other page for the chip itself. So remember I said this page is generally for the board and this page is for the chip and everything about the chip. So again, we've got a description here. It describes the chip, what features it has, um, circuit diagrams, but what we want is to come over to this documentation tab once again. And if we come down, you can see we've got a whole bunch of other documents in here. We've got more specifications, notes, technical notes. There's loads of stuff in here, but the ones that I recommend you download and the ones that I use regularly are the reference manual and the programming manual. So let's go into the reference manual. I'll drag these to the end here, and I'll also open the programming manual as well. These just open as a PDF in Chrome, and remember if you wanna download it, you can do that. As I mentioned in the introduction video, these chips are very complex, and the documentation for them can be quite long, right? This is 847 pages, and this document covers basically everything about the chip and how to set up the chip. If we go to the table of contents, you can see it talks about everything, right? We've got the system architecture. We've also got power controller. If we go down a little further, we've got stuff like GPIO, how to configure all that, the registers, the ports. Uh, we've got DMA, direct memory access. So any feature that you'd like to use, interrupts, we've got analog to digital converter, all these things are used. And again, I come back to the Arduino where none of this stuff is kind of shown to you. It's more like follow the tutorial, hope it works, and kind of rely on all this stuff working. Whereas with these chips, you can configure everything down to the register, down to the bit. You have full control over everything. So again, have a look through it. See, you know, if you're interested in learning more, you can read about specific things. It's unrealistic to sit down and read all 847 pages. You're just not gonna do that. But what you do is when you're developing, you find a part that you're interested in, you go look it up, you read about it. And that is basically how you learn and how you develop your skills in hardware and as an embedded systems engineer. Again, we have a page here about timers. Timers are really important. Input capture, output capture, PWM, it's all there. You can learn about it. You can see it even goes into the block diagrams of how these things are set up. The detail is awesome which again, I said in the last video, I love ST because they provide all this stuff for you here in black and white. They don't hide anything away. It's all there, which is what you want. Always transparency is really important. So as I said, that's the reference manual. Now the other manual here is called the programming manual. This document covers the programming as the title suggests but it goes into detail about the registers and that system level software, which it talks about here. So if we go down, we can have an, a quick little look. So we've got the memory model. So let's take a look at that. So this goes into full detail again on memory map and how it's all set up. And if we just go to another page, address alignment. It's basically all about the chip and how it uses memory, how it executes instruction sets. And it's a deep dive on the chip. So anything again, anything you wanna know, it's all in here. As I said, you don't typically sit down and read it. You find something you're interested in and you go ahead and do a bit of research. So as I said, go and download these. They're gonna be useful. Save them to your computer safely. And that way you've got them ready to reference. And you also now know where to look if you want to find other resources. And just as a quick example, that's just one board. So if we go here and we type in STM32, F4 Discovery, 
which is the other board I showed you. Let's search that. There it is. We can click on the F4 Discovery, scroll down a little bit, and there it is. There's the board I showed you in the last video. And again, CAD resources, schematic packs. It's all there. So whatever board you use, there's a different page dedicated to that board or that chip. And all the information's there. This has a slightly different programming manual because that board is more advanced, it has more features, more timers, lots more stuff. But as I said, as a beginner, you're just looking to get into STM32, this is the board you want. So now that we've talked about the development board, the manuals, and where you can find all the resources, let's talk about STM32 CubeMX. Now CubeMX is one of the best pieces of software I can pr pretty much imagine for hardware development. It kind of changed the game in that it made hardware become more of a visual experience in terms of setting up the chip. It used to be that you had to set up all your timers and your registers using just code and you'd have to reference the manual and literally set the bits which was time consuming, confusing and you'd often make mistakes and it is still that way for a lot of microcontrollers and that's kind of why again I love ST and the STM32 chip because they've made an effort to kind of make hardware a bit more accessible to everyone right the tools are there and it's so easy to use. So as I mentioned briefly there, the Cube MX is used to set up the chip and generate code that we can then modify to perform our own tasks. So the development process kind of happens in two stages. You've got stage one, you set up your hardware, you set up your ports and your timers and all this stuff. Then you generate files that you import into an IDE and that's where you do your development and your coding. So I'm going to show you that in this video as well towards the end. But I just wanted to show you each of the packages first so that we kind of know what we're going to need. Now I'm also going to briefly cover STM32 Cube IDE here. I'm not going to be using this for this tutorial. Mainly because it's based on Eclipse and my experience with Eclipse is kind of horrible. I don't like it. It makes everything harder than it needs to be. It's buggy. There are other tools out there that make this so much easier. The software that I'm actually going to be using in this tutorial is paid software, but there is a 30 day free trial, so at least you can follow along and try it out. Now I know a lot of people might push back on this a little bit, because most people don't like paying for software, and it always kind of baffles me really, because if you know anything about tools and workbenches and that kind of thing, you're only ever as good as the tools you have, right? And good tools are expensive, but they last, they work and they make your life a lot easier. I've always kind of questioned why people don't really like paying for software. You know, software's hard to develop, it's, takes, it takes time, and it can't always be free. And it's funny because a lot of people, you know, they're happy to go out for a weekend, they'll go for food, maybe go to the cinema, stay somewhere in a hotel, go out for a drink. And you can easily spend a few hundred pounds in a weekend doing that kind of stuff. But when it comes to paying for tools and software, people always push back. Oh, I'm not paying that. But, you know, you pay for one license, you've got it for life. So it depends how seriously you take hardware development and whether you can see yourself using it regularly in the future. So let's go and have a look at that. So I'm going to click here. And as I said, I'm going to put links to all these pages down in the description below. So the piece of software I'm talking about is called Visual GDB. It's not an IDE, it's actually a plugin for Visual Studio. And I can't tell you enough how awesome this is. From my experience in hardware over the years, this just makes it 10 times easier to develop. It speeds the process up. It is awesome. You know, this isn't a sponsored video. I'm not getting paid to say this. I have no commission if you buy this. I just love this software. I'm happy to promote it. It works, I use it on a daily basis. It is awesome. So what is it? Let's have a little look. And as I said, if we click on download here, there's a free trial, right? You get 30 days to try it out. So you haven't got to pay anything up front. So if we go back a little bit here, we'll come to learn more. So Visual GDB, as I said, is a plug into Visual Studio. We're going to be using Visual Studio as our IDE, which I'll show you how to set up. But basically, this is a tool that lets you do a whole bunch of hardware development 
in Visual Studio. What I love about this is that it handles all the annoying, complicated stuff for you. So as I mentioned with Eclipse, if you're gonna use that, oftentimes you could spend 20 minutes setting up your environment before you even flash any code or do any of the fun stuff, right? It's all about setting up file paths, linker scripts, and all that rubbish which is boring and quite annoying. Whereas this, it does everything for you. It downloads all the tool chains. It downloads all the debugging software. And it just handles the STM32 device packages. It does it all for you. It's literally plug and play. And you'll see that when we set it up. You can do a whole bunch of stuff on here. It's not just STM32. So if we click the embedded systems tab, there's a thousand plus devices that you can program with this plugin. And you can see we can also do ESP32. We can do MSP430, TI, Atmel. There's just loads and loads of stuff. And if you want to check out the list of all the devices, you can go and do that. It covers pretty much everything here. If you pay for a more advanced license, you can get Linux development, Android development, just so much. So I'm not going to go through all these features and talk about it too much. I kind of just want to show you in the setup. So if we go to buy now, so the basic package, which is what I have here is the embedded package. And with that, you can only do embedded system stuff. So you still get all those thousand plus devices, except you can't do other things like Android or Linux development. If you want to do that, you will have to purchase a more advanced license. But if you want the basic one, I paid this around three or four years ago, $99. But if you're a student and you have a student email address, you can actually get 50% off. So you could pick this up for $50 or maybe £40 here in the UK. And it's worth it. I promise you, it's really worth it. You know, that's the cost of a PlayStation game or a PC game, whatever. It's really worth it. So what we'll actually do now is we'll click on this, get free trial. And you can download it. Just click this try it now button. And that'll download the installer for us to our machine. The trial, I believe, is version 5.6. And I think you do get access to all the features in the trial. So you should be able to do Android, Linux, and a bunch of other stuff. But I actually have a license. So I'm going to go ahead and download the version for my license. So I'm going to go and do that. And if you do want to download an older release, you can do that just by going here. And you can see all the previous releases are here. And you can even find which version you can have based on your license key. So you can click on this, you can enter your license key, and you can download whichever version you're, you have available to you. The version I have access to is 5.4 R12. So I'm gonna download that. And in fact, for following the tutorial, you might also wanna download 5.4 R12. They should be pretty much the same, but just in case there's a little difference, uh, maybe the tutorials don't quite match up. What we'll also do is come back to the CubeMX tab. We'll go down a little bit and you can see that we can download this for either Linux, Mac or Windows. I'm on a Windows machine. I'm going to download the latest version, which is 6.2. And you probably will need to sign in to download this, which is perfectly fine. I recommend you create an account. So again, select which version we want. We want to accept the conditions. Okay, so once you've selected the version and hit download, you'll see that'll start downloading. And while that's downloading, let's talk a little bit about Visual Studio. So I briefly talked about it. And basically, if you've never heard of Visual Studio, it's one of the most popular and advanced development environments there is. You can do so much in it, mostly software based. So Windows applications, Android applications, lots of back end, front end stuff. Generally, there's never been support there for hardware, which is where the Visual GDB plugin comes in. They kind of came in and said, well, okay, we'll create a plugin that allows you to do hardware development inside of Visual Studio. You're going to see how kind of nice it is when we get started. This can all be done with a free version of Visual Studio. So again, when you come to this page, you want to hit this drop down and download the Community 2019 edition. So just to briefly recap on what we've done, I showed you the board, we downloaded the schematics, I showed you the chip, we downloaded the reference manual and the programming manual. We have also downloaded CubeMX, which is the first piece of software, Visual Studio Community 2019, which is the second piece of software. And finally, you'll want to download the Visual GDB free trial. So now that we've got everything we need, let's go ahead and install it. And as I said, I stripped everything off my computer so I can go through these with you, just in case you kind of feel a bit lost, because I know 
when you are installing something that you're not really familiar with, you can be unsure of what you need to install, right? So first thing we'll install is CubeMX. So this is in a zip file, so we're gonna extract this first. We're gonna hit OK. You see we've got a folder here, CubeMX. We're gonna go in there and we're gonna double click on that. We wanna approve the admin rights. And you can see that install is running. If it takes a while, I'll speed up the video and I'll continue talking when I need to. So you can see here, we're about to install the software. So let's hit next. We wanna to agree to the license terms. If you agree and you've read through all of that, let's hit next. Um, again, I agree, I consent, it's all good. Next. Now this is where it's gonna install the program too. We want it on our C drive. It'll create this directory called stm32 cubemx. We wanna hit next. It'll say a target will be created. Okay, that's good. It'll also ask about start menu shortcuts. We just wanna leave this at default. We're just gonna hit next. And now that's gonna install everything we need for cubemx. So I'll probably speed this up because it might take a while. All right, so our installation appears to be finished. So we'll click next. And then we're just gonna hit done. Shortcut on your desktop that looks like this. STM32 cubemx. We're gonna double click. And here we go, so this is the first time we've launched it. You can see it's kind of already detected a few of my previous projects. If you've never used it before, you won't see anything there. We're not gonna do anything just yet, so we're just gonna go ahead and close this for now. All right, so let's jump back to our downloads folder, and the next thing we're gonna install is Visual Studio Community, which is the IDE that we'll use to do our development. One thing as well I'd recommend with Visual Studio is installing a previous release. This is generally just how development works in general. You never really want to be on the latest version of an IDE because they can update it and it'll cause something to break. So you want to be sticking to a version that you know is stable, especially with Visual GDB being a plugin. When it comes to Visual Studio, if Visual Studio do an update and the plugin doesn't support it yet, it could cause issues. So I leave a link to this in the description below, which is previous releases of Visual Studio. And if you scroll down, you can see you get a whole bunch of different releases. Now the one I'm using is 16.4. So that goes way back to December 2019. Now to download version 16.4, just click on professional here and that'll download uh, an installer for you. And yes, obviously we want the community version. When you come into the installer, all you have to do is just wait for the menu to pop up. You can see that once we're in the installer, if we just close this menu here, you'll see two tabs here, installed and available. I've already installed the community version, but if you click available, you'll see enterprise professional and community, and you just wanna go and install community. Once the installer launches, you should be greeted with something like this. And you can see there's loads of different things that we can select. Now I don't recommend installing everything here because it's gonna take up a ton of storage space and we don't really need all of it. So the things that I do recommend you select are this one here, which is desktop development with C++. This might come in handy in a later video where maybe we learn about some C programming and I'll do some programming tutorials. So you might as well install that. Other stuff, not really necessary. You could maybe do Python if you're interested in that. I'm not gonna do that. If you scroll down, there's a whole bunch of other things and you can see now what I was talking about, just about how much you can develop and do inside of Visual Studio. We're gonna go back up. Remember, just select desktop development with C++. We're gonna go ahead and hit install and it'll say there as well how much space it's gonna need. So it's gonna need 7.8 gigabyte roughly. Now this will take a while, as I said, seven gig to install, quite a bit to download. So once again, I'll speed up the video. After completing the installation, it's gonna tell you that you need to restart your computer. So I'm gonna go ahead and do that now. All right, so I've restarted the computer and now on my desktop, you can see I've got a shortcut called Visual Studio 2019. If you don't have a shortcut on your desktop, as you'd always do in Windows, just hit the start button, search for Visual, and you'll see Visual Studio in there and you can just launch it. Now, before we go ahead and install Visual GDB, we're gonna launch Visual Studio once. So let's go ahead and double click on it. And after that, we should be greeted with a window like this. And we're just gonna go ahead and continue without code here. This will launch up the development environment like this. And the first thing we're gonna do is get rid of this theme. I like the dark theme, so I'm gonna go and change that. So let's go up to tools, options, and under environment here where it says general, you'll see color theme blue. We're gonna go to dark and hit okay. 
And that just makes it a bit easier. It's easier on the eyes, and especially if you're going to be staring at the screen for a long time writing code. Okay, so now that we've launched it once, let's go ahead and close it. And the final thing we have to do now is install Visual GDB. So remember, you downloaded a trial. I'm going to install version 5.4, as I said, because I'm going to reactivate my license. But you should be able to just do a free trial. So I'm going to go ahead and double click. Once you've double clicked there, you should be greeted with a setup wizard like this one. So I'm just going to hit next. I'm going to agree to the terms. I'm going to hit next. Quick installation, I recommend. And just hit install. That'll run through this pretty quickly. It might ask you for administrative permission. Just hit yes. That'll fly through the installation. Once the setup has completed, just hit finish and we don't have to do anything else with that now. So let's go ahead and jump back into Visual Studio. Again, we're going to continue without code. That'll launch up the window for us. And if we go up to top here to help, you'll see there'll be a option here now called About Visual GDB. Click on that and that'll bring up this window. Now you can either start a trial. Obviously, I've used a trial in the past, so I can't do that. But you should be able to click Start Trial here and you will get a 30 day free trial. I'm going to go ahead and quickly activate mine by entering my license key. So there we go. You can see it's recognized my license key. I'm just going to hit OK. So now what I should be able to do is go up to File, New, and you should have an option here called Visual GDB Project. So I'm just going to click on that. And in here we have all those different options that I showed you over on the browser where we can do Linux, ESP32, embedded projects, embed Arduino. And yeah, you can even do Arduino through this, which is something I forgot to mention. So we're not going to do anything with that yet. So we're going to hit cancel. And once again, just minimize Visual Studio. We don't have to close it. So now let's get into the good stuff, right? The stuff you came here for. How can we create a project for our STM32 Nucleo 64 board. And we're going to do that. So let's launch the CubeMX once again. So let's go into there. That should launch up for us. And again, we'll be greeted with something like this, which we kind of saw earlier on. So we're going to need to start a new project. And notice here there's a few menus. So you can either start a project using a microprocessor, so the actual chip, you can just filter by the chip. Or if you have a board like this one, you can start project from an ST board. So we're going to click access to board selector. That's going to go ahead and download a few things to get you set up. Just let this run its course. And once it's done, you should be greeted with another menu. So that setup stuff completed and we've got another window here now. And we're in board selector at the top. We've got a bunch of different tabs. We're going to stick in board selector. So what we're going to enter in here is Nucleo. I notice we've got a whole bunch of different variants of it, right? We've got the F07, the F1, the F2, the F3. Now remember, ours is the F401RE. And you can always just type this in. So we can do F401RE. And there's that variant of the chip. So we're going to click on that. And what that will do is it'll filter down to that specific version of the board. So you can see here, this board is the exact board that we've got. And you can see again all the information about the board. You've got the part number. And also what's cool as well is there's docs and resources in here. So kind of like I showed you before on the website, you can get access to that stuff in here as well. So once we've selected the correct board, we want to hit start project. It says initialize all peripherals with their default mode. Yes. And that's going to open up CubeMX with this exact chip. And you can see here we have a chip in our UI and you can see all the different output pins around it. Now I'm not going to dive into loads of detail in this video, but I'll kind of describe what we've got here. So as I mentioned earlier, CubeMX kind of changed the game in making chip setup into this kind of visual experience, right? And it made it so much easier. So on the left here, we've got two tabs. We've got categories and A to Z. If you click A to Z, you'll see all the different functionality of the chip and you can click and configure each of these. So let's say we wanted a timer. We can click on timer one. That opens up a sub menu of that and you can enable different channels for different timers. Now we're not going to worry about that too much. So we're going to minimize that. And there's two arrows here. If you click the top one, it'll minimize that over. So what we've got here is a chip that is on our board, right? This is the STM32F401RE and it's the 64 pin package. Now, these things around the edge here are each of the tiny little pins you see on the, on the chip. So what we can do is we can configure each of these pins to be inputs, outputs, PWM, everything. So if we just click on one of these pins, PC9 for example, 
we've got a bunch of options here. We can set this to be a GPIO input, an output, an analog input. You can set it to be an external interrupt. And you've got all this flexibility over what pins you want to use. And again, this is something I really like about STs. They just make it easier for you. So as I said, we're going to be flashing the board with some code that's going to flash a little green LED here. This pin here, PA5, that is going to be our green LED. And that's already connected up on the nuclear board because we're using a default project for this board. So this is essentially like a baseline project where we can toggle an LED and then add stuff of our own. One thing you'll want to make sure of, which should already be set up, is if we click on Sys here, we click on this button to extend that tab, and this should be serial wire, because we're going to be using the ST-Link programmer that's already on the top of the board. So the nuclear board is actually only the bottom two thirds. The top third is just a debugger. So we can use that, and it's going to be serial wire. If you've used hardware in the past and you like using JTAG or something else, you can set that up as well, but you're going to have to do that manually. So we're going to close this. Our goal for this video is to just flash code to the board. I want to show you that process. So this is where you do all your pin configuration. Then if we go over to the next tab here, which is clock configuration, this is where you set up your clocks and the frequency, the speed, everything that you want to configure. And you can see we've got a bunch of different pre-scalers so we can get subdivisions of the clocks at different speeds. You just have so much control. And again, on Arduino, you don't really get any of this. You have to do it all manually via code if they even give you the option. Again, it's just nice to have it all laid out. You can choose to use the high speed internal clock or the high speed external clock. Again, just leave it default. You can actually change the speed if you want. So if you wanted to use, let's say 32 megahertz, so let's go and change this to 32. Now if we hit enter, it'll work out all the prescaler values for us. So we just hit enter. You can see it's recalculated everything based on that. Now, the next thing we're gonna do is go to project manager. And we're just gonna go here where it says tool chain or IDE. So the first thing we're going to do is just save our project. And this saves all the hardware configuration stuff that we're doing inside a CubeMX. So I recommend creating a directory. I actually have one here in my documents where I store all my visual GDB stuff. So I'll create a new folder in here. It doesn't matter where you put this as long as you point it to the right place. So I've got a folder called visual GDB. And in here I'm going to have a folder called STM32 tutorial. And that's it. So now I'm going to minimize this. I'm going to go to File, Save Project. I'm in that same directory, so I'm in my Documents, Visual GDB. I'm just going to select that folder that I just created, STM32 Tutorial. I'm going to hit Save. And now you can see that saved the project for us and filled in a lot of this information about the location and the project name. Finally, the last thing we're going to do here is this drop down here where it says Toolchain slash IDE. Now this is the code generator and there are different formats for generating the code for different development environments. Now you can see there's a few different ones. Now if you're going to use STM32 Cube IDE, which I talked about earlier, so if you don't want to pay for this software in the future, you can come and download the Cube IDE. You just scroll down, you download it for the platform you want, and then you can use that instead. Like I said, there's a little more setup, it's a little more fiddly, and I don't like it personally, but you might like it. So even try it out if you want to after this tutorial. So once you've got that, if you were to create one of these projects for the Cube IDE, your tool chain here would have to be STM32 Cube IDE, which makes sense, right? You're exporting this project for that IDE. In this case, we are using Visual GDB with Visual Studio. So our tool chain is gonna be other tool chains, which is GPDSC, and that's the one we wanna select. So what we'll do is we'll actually start from zero. So up here, there's a pinout option. We're gonna click that drop down. come down to clear pinouts, click yes, and that just wipes everything, right? We've now got nothing, the chip isn't doing anything, and we need to set everything up. So the idea of me showing you this is you can see what the kind of bare bones are for you to start a project. So the first thing I always do, as I said before, you wanna to go to system and you wanna put debug to serial wire because that's what's gonna allow us to flash the code and also use breakpoints to debug 
our software. So you want to turn that on. And you notice what that will do is it'll use these two pins up here. We've got serial wire clock and serial wire data input output. So that's what we'll need to start with. Then the only thing we really need from there is to come to RCC. We're going to go to high speed clock and we're going to use crystal ceramic resonator. And that's basically a oscillator for our microcontroller to keep time. Now this does have an internal and an external oscillator. You can use either. We're just going to go for the high speed external for now and we're going to leave that as it is. And that's basically it. That is the bare minimum of what you need to get the chip up and running. You've got a clock source, you've got a way for debugging and flashing the chip, and that's it. Everything else is up to you, and you can define your input output for what devices you want to communicate with. Now we still want to be able to flash that little LED, so I'm going to go ahead and add that in just like it was before. So we're going to come down here to PA5, we're going to set this up as a GPIO output, and if we right click on that, we can go to enter user label, and we can rename it. So we're gonna call it LED. And that way you can easily keep track of which pins or which ports are related to which hardware. So we know that this port instantly is that LED. We know that this instantly is to do with the serial wire debug. And you can rename all these as well if you want to, but generally they're named pretty well. So from here, we've made our changes. Remember, we're still in the same project. We didn't create a new one. So remember in our CC here, we chose to use our high speed external. So we need to reflect that in the clock configuration as well. So in here, we need to select our, we've got our input frequency here. We need to select our high speed external, which we'll do. And then up here on the system clock max, we also want to select high speed external. That's going to be a default of eight megahertz, which is fine. So then from there, we're just going to go to generate our code. That will generate the files for us. And we should see a message saying that it's been completed. There we go. We hit close. Now let's go back to Visual Studio. And remember, we've got an empty workspace. If you load it back up, remember to click continue without code. And that gets you to this. Now, let's go ahead and import what we just generated into Visual Studio. So let's go to our Windows directory. Let's go into that STM32 tutorial folder. And you'll see there's a bunch of stuff in here, right? We've got these two folders. We've got core and in here is an include and a source and we've got drivers and this is basically all the stuff that the chip needs in order to run all the libraries tons and tons of stuff in here if we go into the drivers you'll see everything's in here we've got adc we've got dma uh, i squared c spi real-time clock spi loads and loads of stuff that is just those files you don't need to worry about. Those are just the low level libraries that it calls kind of under the hood. You don't need to mess with those. I just want you to understand that this is the stuff that it generates that you don't really want to mess with, right? You, If you want to change something in the hardware, you do that here in CubeMX. So don't generate your code, then go into one of these files and add some code or change something because when we regenerate the project later on, those files will be wiped as standard. And I'll, I'll explain that a little bit later. We've got our file directory here. So let's go back to Visual Studio. And this is where we now need to integrate what we've just generated with Visual Studio. So we're going to go to File, New, Visual GDB Project. We're going to select Embedded Project Wizard. And we're going to select the location. We're going to click Browse. Click this directory. Now for our directory, what I'm going to do is select the exact same directory I created before for the CubeMX project. So remember I'm in my documents, Visual GDB, and we created that folder, STM32 tutorial. So I'm just going to select that and hit OK. Hit OK again. That'll update our location. Now I'm going to give the project a name. I'm going to call it STM32 tutorial, and I'm going to hit add. Now that'll open up a new window again. Now this is gonna walk us through what type of project we wanna create, right? So we're gonna leave most of this default. It does most of it for you. But the one thing we're gonna change is down here, we need to click on this that says automatically import a project in a different format. So remember in CubeMX where we generated a other tool chain, GPDSC, well that now comes into play here because we need to import that type of project. And you'll see when we click that, We've got a bunch of other options and we're gonna select import an existing STM32 CubeMX project in the GPDSC format. So we click on that. 
it's going to ask us to select that file. We click on this little folder button. We then go into our documents, into our directory here, STM32 tutorial, which we created. And you'll see a folder in there that has the extension on it, GPDSC. And it's the same name that we gave our project. So in this case, STM32 tutorial.gpdsc. You want to click on that and then click open. And you'll see that'll update that for us. Then we're just going to click next. And in here, this is where we select our device. Now, because we generated the code through CubeMX, it already knows what device we're looking for, right? We've got STM32 F401RE. But if you're using a different device, you can just filter and search for a different device. But obviously, we want to use the device that we're using. That makes sense. So we're just going to leave that as it is. Now, make sure your tool chain up here. It should be default. As I said, Visual GDB handles all this for you. So in something like Eclipse, you'd have to go and download the tool chain separately and then link the tool chain. And then you'd have to link the linker script and add all these directories manually. Whereas here it's just done. It just does it for you. So again, we want to make sure our device is correct. F401RE, that's fine. And we're just going to go ahead and click next. Now that's going to go and check that all the code compiles and that there's no errors. And it's going to ask us what we want to debug using. Now, if your board isn't plugged in like mine, it's just going to be empty, right? No device is found. There are other debug methods you can use. If you click on this, these might be familiar to some of you if you've used them before. Open OCD, JLink, PyOCD. And if you want to use JLink with these boards, you have to flash the board with a flashing program also provided by ST that just changes it from ST link to J link. But we're not going to use J link. It doesn't make sense when we've already got an ST programmer built on the board. So again, come back to USB devices. Now what we're going to do is plug in our STM32 nuclear board. Notice when we plug it in, immediately here we have a USB device available that says ST-Link V2.1. So we're going to click on that. And now we have a debugger attached to our chip, which is already on the board. And we've told Visual GDB that that's what we're going to be using to both flash the code and also debug. And again, you leave all this as standard. You don't have to mess with it. We can just hit finish. And just like that, we've built a project in Visual Studio that is designed for our STM32 nuclear board. And just to prove how easy this is, go up to build and click build, and you'll see that it'll build instantaneously with no errors, which honestly is unheard of in hardware. Usually when you set something up, it'll build and it'll fail. Something will be wrong, there'll be a script missing, a linker will be missing, or there's a directory missing. Something will go wrong. You saw how easy that was. And again, this justifies why I recommend purchasing this software because it just it just takes the hassle away, right? You get to get on with the fun stuff without worrying about directories and linker scripts and all that rubbish, right? We just want to start, get into it, set up our hardware, set up our software and crack on with it. And that's what we're going to do. So let's have a look at how we access our code files and which ones we need to worry about. So we've generated the project, we've built the project. You can see here, build one succeeded, zero failed, zero up to date, zero skip. That means that we could flash the code to the board with no errors and it should run, but we're not gonna do that just yet. So what I wanna focus on now is source files and header files. Obviously we wanna be able to modify the code and add stuff in. So let's look at the directory on the right here and you'll see this source files with this little drop down arrow. So in there, we have our main.c and that is our main script, right? This, if you're familiar with programming, main.c is where all the magic happens. And that's kind of the core part of the programming, right? That this the system. Then you can create your own functions if you want to in other files. So if we scroll down a little here, you can see that in here we have a main setup and there's a while loop here, which is our main loop. So on Arduino, you're probably used to using a for loop or something like that that just loops over and over and over and keeps running your code. Well, this is the same, right? But we actually have real C code with uh, real header files and a real project setup that we have full control over. So if you've just come up from Arduino, you might look at this and be a little bit intimidated. You might think, I don't know what any of this means. There's loads of lines, loads of comments. And when you go to the bottom, you'll see stuff like this, system clock config. And you just think, 
you know, I don't know what any of that means. Do I need to change it? And the answer is no. Everything down here is all configured through CubeMX. So everything we set up here has been generated to files that are set up here. And you don't need to worry about all this extra stuff. The only stuff you need to worry about in your program is mostly the stuff at the top and in the main loop. So if we look here, we've got a bunch of different comments. It says user code begin includes. So as I said, you want to pay attention to these comments where we have user code begin and user code end. Just to give you an example, if I create uh, an integer, so if I do uint8 and I just call this variable x, uh, we make that equal to zero. Now, if I put another variable in a different place, which is not between those user code brackets, so if I do uint8 and we call this var y equals zero and we hit save. Now, I'll be able to build this just fine like I did before. So if we click build, you can see it succeed. Let's say now we were mid project and I made a hardware change in CubeMX. So if I went back to CubeMX and I changed a pin here, for example, and then I hit generate code again. So what CubeMX is doing there is it's regenerating our core and drivers folders. And again, if we go back to Visual Studio, you can see it's already updated on its own. You saw that little difference there, but look what's happened. The code that we placed outside of the user code comments has gone and the code that we placed inside it is still there so it's important to follow these guides when you're developing because when you make a change like i just showed you and regenerate the files the code will be deleted if you're not following these practices so as i said we're not going to get too deep in this video i just wanted to show you how to set everything up so now that we know where we can create our variables like you would on arduino you can also create function prototypes there as well or functions and you can also add your header files up here so there's another folder called header files and in there you've got main.h and if you declare a function for example you can then add your uh, prototypes in here so that our code knows what it's doing but as I said don't worry too much about what's in here this is all just initialization stuff we've got our main we're doing initialization inside our main then we've got our while loop. Okay, so now that we know kind of what the CubeMX does and how we can import that into Visual Studio, what we'll do now is write a super simple program that's gonna flash a green LED on the nuclear board. And as I said, with your program, you wanna use those comments as a guide. So we're gonna be using our while loop here, which as I said, is just like a main loop on the Arduino. We loop around that constantly and that's where we add our own code. So I'm gonna make that LED flash. And there's a couple of different types of functions built in to HAL, which is the hardware access layer for STM32. So if we just type in HAL underscore, we're gonna do GPIO. Now you can see here what I talked about before with Visual GDB, you get this entirely sentence, which is suggesting functions for us to use to toggle GPIO. So in this case, we wanna to toggle pin. Now we need to give it the port that we created for that pin. So if we go back to CubeMX, we know that we created that LED on port A. So we've got PA5, so it's port A pin five. So we're gonna come back and we're just gonna type in GPIO A and then the pin will be GPIO underscore pin five, the semicolon. And now that should compile for us. So if we go to build, build solution, that builds, but of course, this is just gonna toggle it on so fast that it look like it's always on. So we need to add a little delay. So underneath, we will do how underscore delay, and we'll make this 500 milliseconds. And this is gonna be a block in approach, which is not good practice, but that's something we'll cover in another video. You never really wanna use hard delays like this in a while loop, uh, but as I said, we'll get onto that stuff. So now what they should do is toggle this GPIO output which is our LED, every 500 milliseconds. So as I said, let's go up to build, build solution, and then we wanna deploy code to the board, hitting that visual GDB debugger button. So let's flash the code. You'll see across the bottom, the flash will work. And if we take a look at the board, you should see that green LED blinking every 500 milliseconds. 
And there we go. We've just written the first program for our STM32 Nucleo 64 board. And it wasn't that difficult, was it? It was quite straightforward once you kind of know what you're doing and what all these tools actually do. So if we stop debugging now by hitting the stop button, let's do that a little bit quicker. Let's make it blink every 250 milliseconds. So we just change that value, deploy our code once again, and now you should see the LED blinking even quicker. And there we go, you can see it blinking every 250 milliseconds. So that's basically it for this video. That's where I wanted to leave this one. I wanted to show you how you can install everything, how you can get a basic program flash to the board, and just getting you to understand that workflow and the process you go through in setting up the hardware in CubeMX, generating the files, importing those files, and then writing your own code in Visual Studio with a Visual GDP plugin. So that's it for this one. I hope you found it useful. If you've got any questions, which I'm sure a few of you have, please leave them in the comments below. The next video, we're probably gonna take a look at debugging a little bit more, just so you can kind of get your head around that. And we'll also dig a bit deeper into the code as well, just to familiarize you with this um, Visual GDB and Visual Studio. Special thank you to my website members who help support the channel and make it easier for me to keep making videos like this and supporting my actual projects. Their support is massively appreciated. Thank you. As always, thanks for watching. I hope you learned something and I'll see you in the next video.